During the last uh, several months, our auditorium class has been studying a variety of topics out of the uh, first out of the uh, first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. We've been doing, you know, working our way through that uh, epistle. So in my sermons uh, today, I'll be preaching this morning, of course, and this evening. In those two lessons, I'd like to review with you one of the most important topics that Paul does talk about in 1 Corinthians, and that is the subject of the resurrection. Now the gospel writers describe the events that lead up to and include Jesus' resurrection, but they don't mention our resurrection very much. This is left to the writers of the epistles to develop. No one discusses this subject in more detail than the Apostle Paul in the first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15. So this morning we're going to review a passage that not only talks about Jesus' resurrection, but also gives us a glimpse of what our resurrection will be like. Now, in order to speak about the resurrection, we must first talk about the phenomena of death itself. Death is not you know, an enjoyable subject to talk about. We uh, usually ignore it until it happens to someone who is near us. Then it becomes very real. It becomes life-changing. It becomes a very powerful event in our lives, not just discussing it as a subject, but very real in our lives when a, a parent or a loved one uh, passes away. Now men have struggled with the reality of death in different ways throughout history. Uh, for example, the Greek philosophers thought that the best way to deal with the inevitable fact of death was to actually take control of death yourself by committing suicide. The idea was, well, there's nothing we can do about death, it happens to everybody, but in order to have some control over it, we'll just commit suicide. It was considered a noble thing to do. It was considered uh, an enlightened way to deal with death. At least you had some control over the time and the place and the manner. And of course there are many superstitions and ideas, ceremonies, philosophies to help people deal with the reality and the very real pain that death causes in a family. Paul sums up the non-believers' feelings about death in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, when he says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. In those days, like today, when it came to death, unbelievers had no knowledge, and they had consequently no hope. And they, all they knew was that everybody was subject to death. All they knew was that no one ever conquered death. All they knew was the only thing one could do when it came to death was to grieve. And so this was the condition of man until the coming of Jesus Christ insofar as death is concerned. However, Jesus Christ dealt with death in a way that no one had ever done before and no one has since. With Jesus for the very first time, someone claimed openly to have power over death. In Matthew 28, 18, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me, all authority. That's authority over life, authority over death. First time in history somebody actually said, I have authority over death. First time in history someone foretold of his own death and subsequent bodily resurrection and then accomplished it before witnesses. Had never been done before. Had been claimed, but never done. That's the passage that Donnie read in John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, Jesus telling that after his death, he would rise from the dead. And most significantly for us, it was the first time in history that such a leader promised to his disciples a similar resurrection from the dead. No leader had ever, no religious leader had ever promised this, even suggested this to their followers. In John chapter 6, Verses uh, 
39 and 40, Jesus says the following, And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Imagine publicly stating, if you become my disciples, you will have resurrection. No one ever had promised such a thing. No one since has ever promised such a thing. So it is this resurrection that I wish to focus on this morning in our study of 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bibles, please open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now in, it, in this passage, Paul not only teaches about the reality of Christ's resurrection, but what that resurrection has accomplished for the Corinthians themselves. And that is the possibility of their own resurrection, and of course, by extension, our resurrection as well. Now, for those of you who were not in my class the last 12 weeks, perhaps a little background on the church in Corinth would be in order here. Among other problems in this particular congregation, it seemed that some were maintaining Greek ideas about the immortality of the soul. And these ideas suggested that after death, the soul escaped from the body to be absorbed into the divine or to continue some shadowy existence in the underworld. The Greeks, did not believe in physical conscious resurrection. They felt that that was impossible. And Paul was scoffed at in Athens when he came to that part in his sermon about the resurrection of the body. They stopped listening at that part. They sent him away when he even suggested that such a thing could take place. So Greeks who had become Christians were hanging on and they were circulating these ideas in the church. And so Paul responds to them by giving more details concerning Christ's resurrection and the eventual resurrection of all believers. And so we begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you read along with me beginning in verse 1, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which, is also, which also you received, in which you stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was, whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and you believed. Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. Well, in the beginning of that passage, Paul reestablishes the fact that Jesus Christ did in fact raise from the dead. And this event was witnessed by numerous people who were still alive at that time and could substantiate his claim. He also reaffirms the idea that the resurrection of Jesus is the basis of the gospel which he and the other apostles preached and the rock upon which their salvation is based. And now in the balance of this passage, verse 12 to 58, I, I read a little further on that I needed to at that point, but in the balance, balance of that passage, 12 to 58, Paul deals with the resurrection of believers. 
And this is what I want to focus on this morning and complete tonight in part two of this lesson. And so from verses 12 to 19, Paul deals with the doubters. There are doubters in this church and he deals with them. He begins by dealing with the logical conclusions that come from doubting the, pro the possibility of, uh, of resurrection. And he says seven things happen when you doubt. Seven things take place when you doubt the resurrection. I'll read again verse 12 and 13 in that context. He says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. So the first thing that happens if you doubt is if the resurrection from the dead is impossible, then Christ is not raised. If that's not a possible thing, then Jesus is not raised. That's what happens when you, when you doubt. Secondly, in verse 14, the beginning of verse 14, he says, and if Christ is not raised, then our preaching is vain. Second thing that happens when you doubt. If Christ isn't raised, then their preaching is worthless because that's the core of it. The core of gospel preaching is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, in 14b, another thing that happens, he says, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. If Christ isn't raised, then your faith is for nothing because that's what you hope for. Your hope is not that I am able to come to church every week, although that's edifying. My hope is that eventually I'm going to raise from the dead. And he says, if there's no resurrection, then what you hope for is, you know, is nothing because it's not there. It's not going to happen. Verse 15. He says, moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. So he says, if Christ isn't raised, then we are liars because we declared that God raised him. And you know what? Every other preacher from that time to this time are also liars because all of us have said exactly the same thing. Christ is raised. If Christ isn't raised, then all the preachers, all the apostles are liars because they're saying that this is what God did. In verse 16, continue with me, he says the following. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. If the resurrection, uh, if, excuse me, if there's no resurrection, you're still guilty of sin and condemned. Why? Well, an unrisen Christ means he is guilty of sin since death still holds him and thus cannot be a perfect sin offering for us. That's why we're able to raise from the dead. Death will not be able to hold us. Why? We will not have sin. Why? Because our sins are forgiven. He didn't have sin because he didn't commit any. Therefore, death couldn't hold him. We won't have sin because our sins have been forgiven. And for that reason, death will not be able to hold us. But if Christ isn't risen, then neither are we. Number six, he says in verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If Christ isn't raised, neither will we be, and so we are without hope, just like the pagans. They have no hope, and we have no hope. We may have a religion, but we don't have hope. And then finally, in verse 19, he says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. If Christ is still in the grave, Christians are to be pitied because their entire lives and hopes are based on this truth. So denying the resurrection of Christ has disastrous consequences for believers. If Christ is not raised, then neither are we, and our faith and our religion are worthless. We expect scoffers, and we expect non-believers to deny the resurrection. They always have. That's nothing new. But for those who call themselves Christians or disciples to do so is foolish and dangerous. And so after having addressed the doubters, Paul moves on to speak to those who do believe in the resurrection in order to give them more hope. It's like he's talking to two different groups. First he speaks to the doubters, now he talks to the believers in verse 20 to 28. So stay with me. Verse 20, he says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. 
So Christ has been raised from the dead and this fact witnessed by over 500 witnesses. Imagine, you know, you're, most of you here are old enough to remember the O.J. trial when O.J. Simpson was tried and found innocent. Can you imagine if they would have found just one witness, just one, that saw him on the street or saw him going into that apartment, just one witness, that would have been the end of the case. Imagine if there were 500 witnesses that saw him. I mean, there'd be, there wouldn't have been a trial. And 10 years later or 20 years later after the fact, would those witnesses not be valuable or not be uh, uh, believable just because time went by? Of course not. And so Paul is saying over 500 witnesses of the resurrection, they're to be believed. And in his time, many of those witnesses were alive and could corroborate what he was saying. His resurrection, however, is not like Lazarus' resurrection or Jairus' daughter's resurrection who were brought back to human life having to face death over again. His is a glorious resurrection where he will never face death again. This is the type of resurrection that we're to look forward to, Paul says. In addition to this, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of many other resurrections. I mean, Lazarus' resurrection did not start others. It was only for him and only for a sign. Jesus' resurrection, however, is like the beginning of a harvest, Paul says. The first fruit is a sign that the rest of the harvest is ready. And so in verses 21 to 28, Paul explains how Jesus accomplishes this resurrection and the procedure that it will follow. First of all, he describes how both death and life come into being. Verse 21 and 22, he says, for since by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. So he talks about how life and death both come into being. Death, he says, comes through Adam and all who share in his nature. Adam sinned, we know that, and death entered as a consequence of sin and it spread to all men. Eternal life, on the other hand, comes through Jesus Christ and all who share in his nature. Jesus offers forgiveness for sins, which removes the, the, uh, the penalty of death and access to life. Isn't that what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 6, verse 23? The wage of sin is death, result of sin is death, and what? The free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so death, physical death, spiritual death, comes through Adam because of his sin and his life. And eternal life, eternal spiritual life, comes through faith and union with Christ. Union with Adam brings death. Union with Christ brings life. So Paul is explaining how these two phenomena have entered into the world. And then he talks about the procedure of the resurrection itself. How the resurrection will take place. First of all, he says Christ will raise First, verse 23, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. And then he says, believers will resurrect at Jesus' return. After that, he says, those who are Christ's at his coming. And then he says, there'll be the destruction of the wicked, verse 24 and 25. Then comes the end, when he delivers up the kingdom to, to God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. And verse 25, he says, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And then finally, the destruction of death for both the wicked and the just by the power of the resurrection. Verse 26, the last enemy that he will abolish is death. And then, of course, he talks about the reintegration of man and the Godhead. A really novel idea, not novel, but difficult idea at times. He says, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all and in all. So let's get this order straight, shall we? Christ resurrects first. The believers will resurrect at Jesus' return. And at this resurrection, this will be in conjunction with Several other things happening at the same time. The destruction of the wicked, the destruction of death for the wicked and just. 
and also the reintegration of man in the Godhead. All of this taking place, the, twinkle, the twinkling of an eye. Now, the reintegration of the Godhead, what is he talking about here? Each person in the Godhead has, within the history of mankind, according to the Bible, operated in a special way in order to accomplish man's resurrection. God functioning to bring man to glory. And so God the Father has initiated the work of salvation by sending the Son. The Son didn't send the Father, the Father sent the Son. And God the Son has revealed the Father and His plan to save mankind. The Son has also executed the plan. This is why He came. Jesus said, I reveal the Father and I've come to die for the sins of men. That was the task, that was the plan, that was His role. And God the Holy Spirit has maintained the creation after the fall of man and has empowered the church in its work of preaching the gospel and remaining faithful until the Son returns. You get the idea I'm trying to get across? Each person in the Godhead has had a specific task in interfacing with man in order to save his soul and bring him to glory. The Father sends the Son. The Son completes the plan. The Spirit maintains the church and maintains faith until the Son returns. Now, at the resurrection, <clears throat> none of the persons in the Godhead will need to exercise a separate ministry on behalf of man's salvation, since it will have been completed. The resurrection is the last step. That's what Paul is saying here. God was not going to have to send anybody to reveal Him. The Son is not going to have to die or do anything to save. It'll, the work has been done. The Spirit will not have to maintain the church in a sinful world. All of these things will have been completed. The resurrection of the saints will be the last step. And at that point, Paul is saying the Godhead will be in perfect union with the saints without various roles to accomplish salvation. Paul says that when the last step of the Father's plan, carried out by the Son and powered by the Holy Spirit, when all of this is completed, and what is this thing? What is this thing that is supposed to be completed? What is the plan? Our glorious resurrection. When this is done, the wicked will be punished, death will be defeated, and the Godhead and man will be reintegrated in perfect union. This is the end game. You know the end game of salvation? We always wondered, what's the point? We're being saved for what? Well, the end game of salvation is that we, the resurrected, become part of the Godhead. Let's read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 10 to 12, Paul says the following. He says, for this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Okay, okay, eternal glory. What's this eternal glory he's talking about? It seems that's the end game. He says it is a trustworthy statement, something you can believe and hold on to. And this is the trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will also deny us. So what about our resurrection? Paul silences the doubters by reestablishing the fact that Jesus experienced the bodily resurrection witnessed by hundreds of faithful brethren and they should not doubt this fact, and neither should we. Those witnesses are just as credible 2,000 years later as they were at that time. Time does not erase their credibility. Secondly, he explains that this is a most significant fact in the Christian faith because our hope for forgiveness and resurrection and eternal life is based upon it. Without the resurrection, Christianity is foolish. And thirdly, he begins to describe the process of our resurrection. And he says, death has come through sin. That's the problem in the first place. That's what causes our death. Secondly, the first resurrection begins with Jesus, who is without sin. And then believers will be resurrected when Jesus returns, and that resurrection will be accompanied by the final destruction of the wicked, the final destruction of death itself, and the final unification of God and man. And so in tonight's lesson, we're going to continue with part two of this uh, sermon.
where Paul is going to talk about baptism for the dead and more explanations about the nature of our own resurrection and what we will be like in our glorious state. This morning we've established two important Bible facts. First of all, Jesus Christ rose from the grave as he said he would. This means that all he has said is validated. You know, the one who conquers death can be believed. He can be trusted. He can be obeyed. He must be believed. He must be trusted. He must be obeyed. There is no other option. I mean, who else is resurrected? What do you think Peter is saying when he says, well, who else are we going to go to? We don't like it. You're scaring us to death here. We don't know what's going to happen, but <laughs> you have the words of eternal life. Nobody's ever said this. Nobody has ever done what you have done. And secondly, those who believe in Jesus will also be resurrected. The reason for this, excuse me, the reason for his resurrection was to accomplish our resurrection. There is no other way to overcome death except to believe in Jesus Christ. No other way. These facts lead us to some final conclusions. First of all, if there is no resurrection, then there's no gospel, there's no good news. Any teaching, any suggestion that Jesus did not die or was not physically raised from the dead is heresy, and it should be treated as heresies. And so our leaders and our teachers need to always be on guard for the doctrine of the resurrection. Secondly, if there's no resurrection, well then there's no hope. I mean the central hope of our Christian lives is in our own resurrection. So let's not jeopardize this with foolishness and worldliness and careless sin and disbelief or laziness. I say to the saints, be on guard for your salvation. It is a precious thing. And thirdly, if there's no faith, there will not be a resurrection. The only way to resurrect with Christ is to believe in Him and express that faith in repentance and baptism. So let's not put off until tomorrow the assurance of resurrection and eternal life that we can have today. Procrastinators and doubters out there, be on guard lest you fail to obtain what is freely offered now, but not forever. The preachers who preach to you week after week and invite you week after week are always encouraging you to come and take what God is offering. But they will not always preach and the opportunity will not always be there. If you do not possess this precious hope of resurrection, then please, I encourage you to come now as we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement and I encourage you to come back tonight to find out about the process and the nature of our own resurrection. God bless you. Let's sing.